Jim Brennan, and John Cesarich. Now, live, this is New Center 6, number one in the Capital District. Good evening. Don't get your hopes up too high for this weekend's Superpower Summit. That, in effect, is what President Reagan said this morning as he left for Iceland. Well, the president has now landed in Iceland. And even though he warned Americans not to expect too much from the conference, he said there's a chance for real progress if Soviet leader Gorbachev wants to cooperate. Reagan said he doesn't intend to dash off a few quick agreements, that Saturday and Sunday meetings could be a step toward a better, safer world. Arms control isn't the only issue Reagan wants to raise with the Soviets. He also wants to talk about human rights and regional issues, such as Soviet involvement in Central America and Afghanistan. And speaking at a news conference in Iceland, Kremlin officials said the meeting would be a moment of truth in U.S.-Soviet relations. One thorn in President Reagan's side before leaving for Iceland has been Eugene Hassenfuss. He's the American prisoner being held by the Sandinistas in Nicaragua after Sandinista troops shot down his cargo plane on Sunday. Today, Hassenfuss held a news conference in Managua saying he has been working with CIA employees in 10 different missions to deliver weapons to the Contras. He says the flights were made from air bases in Honduras and El Salvador. Reagan has denied any U.S. involvement with the plane or its crew. And joining us now is Steve Fitz, a local man who worked on intelligence gathering for the U.S. government while in the military. So try and give us a perspective on this Nicaraguan situation. Eugene Hassenfuss first, Steve, says uh, pretty much nothing about what he's doing there. Today he holds a press conference that says he's been delivering arms as many as ten times in Nicaragua. Is it unusual for, uh, for somebody, say, who is working for the government to have a cover? Does the government supply them with a cover? And at what point do they give that cover up? Well, as in the case of, uh, in my case in the military, we were given a, a cover story in the event we crashed and were captured, and it's quite common. I think in the case of Mr. Hasenfuss, he's blaming CIA involvement on the people perhaps who died in the crash, which is obviously most convenient. In, in his case, it's, it's unclear whether he is actually a, currently a, an employee of the CIA, but I wouldn't find that too hard to believe. See, what did you do? Uh, I served in the uh, Air Force uh, intercepting air airborne communications in the Mediterranean. did that for a period of about two to you three years. You flew along the coast of a foreign country, Israel it was, right? In fact, yes, you, were taught, you were taught Hebrew in order to understand what was going on. What if you'd been shot down? Would you have lied about what was going on? Well, as I remember, and that was some years ago, I believe we were told to tell anyone that we were on a weather data gathering mission. I don't think it would have held up, but it was at least something to say to justify why you were out there. In those days, was it common to have private citizens working with government operatives to, uh, to do things like this, perhaps not Nicaragua, but the Israeli area? Well, in the years I was in the service, I never saw a private citizen in my capacity, uh, but it's possible that there were, but I was in a strictly in the military branch with uh, Air Force and Navy personnel. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. We have to add one thing. If, if your voice sounds familiar, as I'm sure it does to a lot of people, yes, he is the son of Steve Fitz of WQBK. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, a federal judge who tried to deceive the government has now become the victim of the first Senate impeachment trial in a half century. The Senate today found Harry Claiborne, Nevada's chief U.S. District Court judge, guilty of high crimes and misdemeanors and ordered him removed from office. Claiborne is now serving time in an Alabama prison on a tax evasion conviction, but he had refused to give up his seat and had continued to collect his salary. The three local Teamsters found guilty of racketeering, fraud, and extortion in an Albany federal court will be appealing that conviction. The federal statute known as RICO, or Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organization, was used to convict Teamsters Louis Spagnola, Anthony Civitello, and business agent J. Michael Ravalado. The local 294 officials were found guilty of extorting thousands of dollars through no-show jobs and meal allowances from Universal Studios during the filming of the 1980 movie Ghost Story in this area. Prosecutor Kevin McCormick today explained how that RICO statute helped them in the case. A whole group of criminals in one indictment and present a whole pattern of criminal conduct to the jury in one package, one single package. McCormick says they were able to include the 18 months of criminal activity involved in the Teamsters case because of that RICO statute. 
And coming up next on News Center 6, another area prostitute has died from AIDS. But there's a new sanctuary where hookers can get help. It's in an area church. And then later, there's a man going around handing out free money. But you might not want to take it. And later on News Center 6, meteorologist John Sesarich has the cool and cloudy details. Schenectady police say a third area prostitute has died of AIDS and that one prostitute who died earlier is known to have shared her hypodermic needle with 12 other abusers. Police say the disease can be contracted by using dirty needles to mainline cocaine. While the state health department says there's not one known incident of AIDS being transmitted from prostitutes to Johns, one reformed streetwalker expressed concern today. Angela Whitfield of Project Safe, a house for a prostitute says the girls who work the street are young and uninformed. They're not concerned. Even though there is a couple of them out there that have died of AIDS, they're not really concerned at all. They're not worried about it. Do you know why? They feel it can't happen to them. You know, that's not going to happen to me. You know, I'm not shooting needles. You know. Whitfield added that the girls now in the care of Project Safe have all been tested and none has the virus. Well, while prostitutes still walk the streets in Schenectady and operate behind closed doors, their activity has been cut by over 50% in the past three years. The reason, Project Safe has given them an alternative and police have beefed up their enforcement. Judy Sanders reports. Schenectady's Albany Street used to be hooker haven. Prostitutes could turn as many as 20 tricks a night. Things were so bad here on Albany Street and the surrounding neighborhoods just a few years ago that any woman walking down the street was probably going to be approached by a John. There was so much violence being threatened by husbands and fathers that the community decided it had to do something. Any woman, any lady, a young girl, didn't make any difference whether she was white or black. She lived in this area, they thought that maybe she was a prostitute. The Reverend Jackson and other community and business leaders forced a crackdown when they presented 1,500 petitions to City Hall three years ago. Prostitution activity has been reduced by more than half since then. Well, there's been a big change, particularly I would say in the past year. Before that, prior to that, there were a lot of prostitutes out. Thanks to these two policemen and these two women, streetwalkers traded the streets for the sanctuary. It's Project Safe, a bare office in a State Street church where hookers can go for help. No one thought it could work. You've got to get to the girl. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there's a lot, a lot of people who laughed at us. They're not laughing anymore. Project Safe has gotten 30 girls between the ages of 12 and 20 off the street with police help. This is where the girls say, hey, I've had enough. I've got to get out of this life. I've been in it for three years. I'm 17. I look like a woman 27. And now it's time to get out. Hope. It gives them hope. I'm, li and li I'm living a normal life. While it gives the girls a normal life and protection from a pimp, it cuts down on crime. Every time we arrest a pimp for promoting prostitution, we're also taking off the street a drug dealer, a person that moves stolen property, and many times persons that are involved in robberies. And it gets the Johns out of circulation. These are the same guys that are, that are going to the neighborhood meeting and complain about the kids playing baseball on their street or vandalism on their street. But these are the guys that are coming around in the city of Schenectady and traverse these streets looking for a prostitute and support this prostitution. Good morning, Project Safe. Project Safe, a safe place that breaks up the cycle of violence. Okay. Judy Sanders, New Center 6, mm -hmm. Schenectady. Tomorrow, Judy will show us how Project Safe severs the, severs the connection between prostitutes and their pimps in an effort to sever that cycle of violence. Last night, we told you about Deanna Labuzetta, a 19-year-old girl from Boston Spa in Saratoga County, who had a stroke that might have been caused by taking birth control pills. Deanna had the stroke while working at Disney World in Florida. Her mother now says that her daughter is doing a bit better and should be flown home by early next week. Deanna had taken only 12 birth control pills for medical reasons. We spoke to Dr. Herbert Gret, the local gynecologist. He says such problems with the pill are rare. Very, very unusual. And this should not deter anybody who needs protection, contraception, from going on the pill. Dr. Gretz does say, however, that some women should not take the pill. They include women who have had heart attacks or strokes, blood clots in their legs or lungs, women who have cancer of the breast or sex organs, and women who are pregnant. Coming up next year on News Center 6, meteorologist John Sesserich says... 
Turn up that electric blanket an extra notch tonight. But first, we'll show you what should be the hottest toy for Christmas. You're watching News Center 6. Coming up next, John Sesserich with the cool and cloudy details. News Center 6 weather is sponsored by Action Chevrolet. Well, Christmas is only two and a half months away, and we have a report on what has to be the hottest concept in toys for the Christmas season. Our money editor, Jack Arnicky, has details. Two and a half months for Christmas. It'll give you just enough time to save for this baby. The new concept, grabbed by a couple of manufacturers, is called laser tag. Another is called photon. They involve an infrared device, just like the remote control uh, TV channel changer, and a receiver to record tags but the kids look at it differently. Oh, I can't you. For them, it's a space-age cops and robbers, a real shoot 'em up in the classic sense with none of the old-time arguments. I got you. No, you didn't. To get ready, the kids put on a belt and attach a sensor, a receiving device, which records when the infrared signal hits. Even out in the open of a backyard, it's a game full of space-age noise. The manufacturer is careful to avoid words like yeah, shoot and gun in the description. The it's phrases like handheld energy unit, star sensor. When there's a hit, it is recorded as a tag. The sensor can record several tags, but the kids don't consider themselves tagged. Dead. This particular model, laser tag, is the higher priced one. It has a longer shooting range, about 100 feet. There are other more inexpensive kits which have about a 30 foot range. This particular model is featured on the cover of what's probably the highest class gadget catalog around, the Sharper Image. Officials at that company say the toy will be the cabbage patch phenomenon of this Christmas season. I got these two at Consumer Discount Catalog Store, and clerks there say demand is very heavy. It seems manufacturers have gotten their sights on some strong profits. Now what you've all been waiting for, the price. This baby, the gun, the sensor, a belt and a holster, $44.95. The Photon, if you can find it, runs just over $39. I think Toys R Us has a few. And finding these things is the key. If demand equals expectation, I expect that in a couple of weeks we'll be stu doing stories of parents in line scrambling to grab up the very few of these that are available. <laughs> You did it. You got hey, me. Hey, what's hey that? you got me. <laughs> That's tag. Does that noise mean thunderstorms? No, no, <laughs> it doesn't. It means All right. I'm shot. I'm a gunner. <laughs> oh, no, tagged. it means you're it, and I'm it's it. your turn, it's my to, turn uh, to, talk about the to move on. Yeah, no thunderstorms, but it is getting cold very quickly out there. Uh, the fall foliage just is probably. Here, I'll turn this off. Turn that off. Like, can they hear me? <laughs> <laughs> the switch on the side. Oh. Anyway. Uh, Good. As far as up in the Adirondack Mountains, it looks like the uh, leaves are past peak already. Uh, the Caskills still look pretty good, except for up in the Adirondacks around Lake George and Prospect Mountain. Still pretty good color up there, but to the northeast and to the east of us in the Brookshires and also in the Green Mountains, past peak. We'll have to wait till next year. Still, they've had a lot of rain over the last couple of weeks out in the Midwest, and it made the Mississippi River, the waters rise to near record floods, and it broke several dikes through uh, parts of Missouri right along the river and also into Iowa, causing widespread flooding. In fact, in Jackson County, Iowa, 3,200 acres of cropland is underwater right now, and more flooding is expected there through the next couple of days. It's going to be for at least another week before the water will finally recede a little bit as many, many roads are closed right along the Mississippi River in West Alton, uh, Missouri, and also in Jackson County in Iowa. No rain there now, but the Mississippi River is very, very high. It almost seems like spring instead of fall. Outside right now, it's very raw. And it's getting that way. Our temperature is 47 degrees with light rain, very high humidity at 90%, rising barometer 30.18 inches of mercury. And we have a northerly wind at 11 miles per hour. Cold air continues to filter in. Right now, it's 66 degrees. Or excuse me, our high temperature was 66 degrees. Our overnight low this morning is our current temperature, which is 47 degrees. So at midnight tonight, we will have our overnight low temperature, if that makes any sense at all, as temperatures will continue to drop. Through we weren't even close to the record high or the record low temperature. So far, they still have light rain at the airport and a trace reported as of 5 o'clock this evening. Radar shows widespread light rain, 
to the Capital District area, and the rain is moving southeast toward it about 25 to 30 miles per hour. Light rain, fog, and drizzle through most of northwestern sections of Massachusetts, southern sections of Vermont right now, and it continues to slide southeast. We're just ahead of a pretty strong cold front, and things clear out to the northwest of us. We take a look at the temperatures. As of 5 o'clock, it is getting cold to the west and to the north of us. You can tell where that cold front is. It runs just now right through Poughkeepsie. There's still 66 degrees. It's a nice 71 degrees in New York City, but behind the front, temperatures drop off about 15 degrees in a matter of only about a couple of hours. Right now, we're at 47 degrees, 46 degrees in Utica, 46 degrees also in Watertown, lower 40s up to the north of us. In Burlington, it's 42 degrees with light rain, Plattsburgh at 42 degrees, and very cold out to the west of us. Northwesterly winds going to bring in some very, very cold air for the next couple of days for us. Even with an abundance of sunshine tomorrow, we're not going to warm up very much. Temperatures in the 40s to the west and to the north of us. To the south of that frontal system, which runs just about through here, right along the mid-Atlantic coast, they're very, very warm. Enjoyed a beautiful day today, 78 degrees in the nation's capital right now, even though they had some clouds around. Now, as the front goes past us, we still have some low clouds to contend with for the next Oh, probably six or seven hours, so we'll have gradually clearing skies. That little batch of rain that's over us right now will slide southeastward, then we'll begin to slowly dry out as drier, colder air starts to filter in. And it is very cold out through parts of the northern Plain states and the Great Lakes this afternoon on a pretty good, brisk, northwesterly wind. Here's a little bit of showers. You can see them dotting just right along that frontal system. That's where the cold front is. To the south, erupting are a lot of showers and some strong thunderstorms in the southeastern part of the country. Also some showers and thunder showers down in the desert southwest. Here's the frontal system. As it goes by us, we're going to have some very, very cold temperatures in the next couple of days. I'll tell you all about it in 30 seconds. Light rain early tonight, then gradually clearing skies and turning colder, a little bit breezy, but not too much. Overnight low down to the freezing mark in town, colder to the north of us in the 20s up in the mountainous areas. Sunny, but still very cool tomorrow. High will only be 51 degrees. Tomorrow night, it's going to be a very, very cold night. Clear skies, overnight low of 25 degrees, and sunshine on Saturday, a high temperature of 58 degrees, so a tad bit warmer. And for Sunday, mostly cloudy skies, a chance of a shower late in the day, high temperature into the 60s, so a little bit warmer weather, then clearing skies on a Monday. So sunny skies on Saturday, clouds roll in on Sunday. That's the weekend. Thank you. Okay. Coming up next on News Center 6, Andrew O'Rourke is charging the governor may be using illegal campaign tactics. Then we follow Pat and Matt as they begin to learn about self-defense. Republican gubernatorial hopeful Andrew O'Rourke today released an anonymous letter accusing Governor Mario Cuomo of using State Inspector General Joe Spinelli and his office for dirty tricks. According to the letter, Spinelli and one of his investigators, George Morosco, investigated clients that O'Rourke had represented before the State Liquor Authority. Sp State Inspector General Spinelli vehemently denied the charges, as did William Cunningham, Executive Director of the State Democratic Party. Now to help us understand what's going on, here is our new Center 6 political observer, Dr. Alan Shartok. What does he think of all this? Listen, Ernie, this is when the going gets tough and the tough get going. This marks the beginning of the real campaign. Now the dirty tricks start. Now the negative research starts. All of a sudden, we have a major accusation that the Cuomo forces have used their state inspector general, who is supposed to be Mr. Clean, for dirty tricks. I know Joe Spinelli. He is a FBI man, a perfectly wonderful man. He comes back today and he says, nonsense. I didn't do what they said I did. I, all I did was look into an anonymous letter that accused the SLA of doing something improper. We found out that the investigation was proceeding exactly as it should have, and I laid off. Well, that's all well and good, and I tend to believe him. But there is an interesting question here, and this is the one that's got a lot of people bothered. This information about what Spinelli was doing somehow found its way into the newspapers. And the question now becomes, who leaked it? The, the real problem here is dirty tricks and whether or not both campaigns are going to be using these kinds of tactics and are going to get themselves into more trouble than the dirty tricks themselves are worth. We'll have to take a look at it, but both sides are relying in this case on anonymous letters. And as we all know, anyone can write an anonymous letter. You can write it about yourself, you can write it from the other perspective. We'll just have to wait and see the way this thing develops. 
Well, workmen putting in a new heating system in Rotterdam wound up making more work for themselves this morning. All of a sudden, there was an explosion at the town highway garage. Police think that a spark from one of the workmen's torches somehow ignited a mostly empty gas can in the garage. The workmen reached, reacted rather quickly and put the fire out themselves before it did much damage. Three workmen were slightly injured. They were treated for minor burns. An escaped burglar, at least an alleged burglar, kept Warren County Sheriff's deputies very busy today. Officers were called to the American Legion Hall on Route 9L in Lake George for a possible burglary. They arrested Stephen Shedlowski at the scene, but a scuffle ensued and Shedlowski got away. Deputies spent the day searching for the escapee. They set up roadblocks all over the area, stopping cars and looking for information. Shedlowski was finally caught late today at the Beachside Cottages in Lake George. Well, learning to search for fugitives is only part of the training that state troopers undergo. Tonight in our third episode of The Recruits, we follow the progress of Matt and Pat in the latest class of the New York State Police. Ken Screven has the story. Well, I'm getting more into the uh, frame of mind of uh, being a police officer. This has really pushed, pushed me to my limits as far as uh, keeping my composure. You know, and um, doing what I'm told all the time, you know, without, without really thinking about whether I agree with it or not, you know, just do it. Trooper cadets Matt Zell of Albany and Pat Radigan of Colony have stuck it out. 54 of their class of 174 have already decided they don't have the right stuff and they've dropped out. It's a long haul from that first day in suits and ties to the third week of dripping sweat calisthenics. The 24-week training period to become a state trooper is no bed of roses. They'll spend two more weeks getting conditioned, preparing for self-defense, hand-to-hand combat skills. Boxing, uh, uh, self-defense with nightsticks, uh, disarming, uh, handcuffing procedures, etc. Pat Radigan says she's been lagging behind the rest of the class, but she's hanging in. I'd get done at night and wonder what I was doing here, but sleep helps. I can see in the mirror that I am in better shape now. I've lost a few pounds, and basically, I just feel all together. I feel it's a really good feeling. By the time they're finished, the cadets will have to be able to run three and a half miles. Ken Scriven, New Center 6, Albany. Coming up next on the New Center 6 Money Report, an area supermarket chain may soon be leaving our area. But first, someone has been giving money away, and it may not have been his money to give. Center 6 Money Reports with Jack Arnicky is sponsored by Uniform Village. Christmas came early to a convenience store in Hudson Falls, but police say Santa's gifts might not have been his to give. Here's Mary Beth Wenger with more on this one. It was a truly bizarre occurrence for this community just east of Glens Falls. A man just walked into the store and started giving out one and five dollar bills to anyone who would take them. It was around 4.30 and all through the store with the usual customers when he walked through the door. The clerks on duty say the man came in carrying a clear plastic bag of money. They say he told them he felt like a rich man that day and offered to buy anything other customers wanted. Well, he just walked around and he was saying, uh, you know, basically anything you want, I'm buying. Everybody thought he was joking at first till I saw the bag of money. He wasn't sporting a red suit with white trim. In fact, police describe him as 28 years old with a long blonde ponytail to his waist. He said he inherited the money. He said it was stolen. He said he had $30,000 in the bag. But he was right about one thing. He predicted the story would make Channel 6. Yeah, he said, watch. Uh, he said, don't worry about the money. It's stolen money and that uh, you'll hear about me on Channel 6. So it's, we were going to get a hold of you to see what the story was. No one in the store had ever seen him before. He said he was just passing through. He bought several magazines and a comb and left the clerk a $4 tip. How have things been at the store today? I mean, have people been coming in? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> what have they been asking? Looking for Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> you think this is and, uh, everybody that I've talked to was kind of upset that they weren't at the store at the time that he was in there. But, uh, yeah, that, that was a strange call. Well, so was a man a philanthropist or a bank robber? Police say so far they've heard no reports of a missing $30,000. The man left with two others described as white males, one of them with dark hair. 
And they left in a car that wouldn't be too hard to spot. It was a white 50s model with fins and a passenger door that's either green or blue. You know, it reminds me of the, the Bob John Ray story. This guy called Bob really? John Ray came to town about five or six years ago in mm -hmm. Mechanicville and supposedly started giving away cars. Who Steven, knows? Steven Spielberg would want this one. Nobody the police, got it. The police checked the it. money, and it is real money. It's not counterfeit money, so okay. who knows? Thank you Quite a that. story. Well, a major change is coming in your choice of places to shop. Money editor Jack Arnicky has the story. And Ernie, one person in the food service industry told me that this is really not going to be good for consumers because it, it lowers competition. It means less competition. One of the players in the food service industry, in the supermarket industry, Albany Public Markets, is leaving. The parent, Wise Markets, today said it is entering into an agreement to lease all area Albany Public facilities to Grand Union, already a well-established player in the marketplace. Wise Markets will continue operations in other New York State areas. What about all of the Albany public employees? Well, there are interviews that will be set up with Grand Union to see if they will be hired. But one employee told me he knows of no other provisions being made. No final date for the transfer has been set as yet, and no word if Grand Union will keep all of the Albany public markets open. Thing. Think it's better than Albany public? I would say so. What's wrong with Albany public? No, it's just not, not as good as it used to be. That was a shopper at Albany Public Market who said he was pleased to see Grand Union coming in. Even though the Dow Industrials went down, much of the overall stock market was higher. AT&T unchanged, GE gained 5 eighths, 9X fell 5 eighths, hapless IBM fell back another 5 points. Mohasco down 3 eighths, Apple Computer up a quarter, Command Airways up an eighth, and Coleco went down a half. On the commodity exchange today, gold fell sharply while the price of silver went down a nickel. Oil people say it's a pretty sure bet that production limits for world oil production will continue through the end of the year rather than ending on Halloween. The question is, can the oil producing cartel keep the cheating to the minimum that it has been for the past few weeks? As we use up the glut of oil in the world, prices may start climbing. General Electric reports its third quarter hike of 5% in its earnings, but unlike the first quarter of the year, GE officials are once again not being specific about the results in the Schenectady-based turbine division. They say the loss is greatly improved over the first quarter. At that time, it was pegged at over $30 million. The nation's retailers say sales were up modestly in September compared to a year ago, but they were below expectations. Sears gained less than a percentage point, Kmart up about 8%. What is Albany County going to be doing with your money? Albany County Executive Jim Coyne unveiled a budget proposing spending $200 million of your money next year, and that includes a 1% tax cut. It would be the seventh cut in the past nine years. And the tax man today had to unlock the Cafe Italia, the owners, and the tax people have reached an agreement. So as of 12.30 today, Cafe Italia was back open for business. That's they've a restaurant closed. in Albany. Yeah, they've closed about a day and a half. All right, thank you, Jack. Well, ahead in sports at the outset, the hitters are second-class citizens in the National League playoffs. Jim Brennan will have that, plus a look at last week's lowlights in the NFL. <laughs> Well, for the varsity football team at Averill Park High School in the Rensselaer County village of Sand Lake, that's about 10 miles east of the city of Rensselaer, there will be no football this weekend. A majority of players admitted today they had been drinking at weekend parties. If an Averill Park athlete is caught drinking, a one-game suspension is automatic. So many players admitted they broke the rule. The team won't have enough players from its 35-member squad to play Rensselaer this Saturday. The game has been forfeited. I think that it's a good thing in the end that these rules are here, we applied them, and uh, in the end our athletic program will be stronger because of it, because I think kids know we mean business. Lonnie Palmer is principal at Averill Park High School. He credits the players with admitting that they drank. He says many would have lied. Parents and students at a school meeting Tuesday night mentioned that drinking had been going on at weekend parties. Palmer asked the varsity football coach to speak with the team and asked players if they broke training rules. A second violation means suspension for the entire season. Well, in sports, it'll be a tough act to follow in Houston. Tonight. Some kind of ball game last night, and maybe tonight the hitters will get involved. It'll be Bob Ojeda going against Nolan Ryan in Game 2 of the National League Series at the Dome, but they'll have a tough time making it a more exciting game than last night. You knew it would be a pitcher's series, but little did anyone think Glenn Davis' second-inning home run here off Dwight Gooden would be the game's only run. Now, Gooden was clearly outpitched by Mike Scott, but Gooden was tough when he had to be. He got out of a bases-loaded one-out jam in the second, and then again in the fourth here when Scott hit into the short-to-second-to-first double play. 
Then in the fifth inning with one out, Denny Walling hit a bouncer to short. Rafael Santana played at home. Billy Hatcher was out at the plate thwarting that rally. But Mike Scott was the big story. He tied a playoff record with 14 strikeouts. His split-fingered fastball was masterful, and his movement on the ball made it tough not only for the hitters, but also for home plate umpire Doug Harvey, who took a little bit of heat over some of his balls and strikes called. Scott's pitch was that tough to follow. And I, I've not seen from any other pitcher throughout the league that's that got that kind of movement on the ball. I'm not going to sit here and ridicule Doug Harvey. He's one of the best umpires in the league. And I like it when he's behind the plate. I thought it was a ball. He thought it was a strike. I was just shocked. I normally don't react, but when he falls that far away, it's, uh, he told me it was a foot outside. And uh, again, it's tough to call those pitches, and he's certainly not going to blame an umpire for it. Well, the Red Sox and Angels will pick it up again tomorrow night in Anaheim in Game 3. Oil can void against John Candelaria. Both clubs hoping to play a little bit better than they did yesterday. And the Red Sox old number 8 knows how to do it. Basic things. Number one, when there's a high sun and no clouds in the sky, you don't use sunglasses. You turn around to the side, lower yourself, bend your knees, then pick the ball up and kind of catch it as if you would a wide receive over the shoulder and a pass from a quarterback. Uh, plus, there were so many mistakes made, not physically, but mentally. Uh, Owens can't get the ball out of his glove, uh, misplays and positioning on people. You can't do this in a short series. When you play seven games, you have to play mistake-free baseball. Let the other team beat you. We have a good pitching staff. Let the hitter score runs. Don't give them runs. Well, here we go. The National Hockey League opens its regular season tonight with 18 of the 21 teams in action. And RPI will be as well represented as just about any U.S. college. Now, Mike McPhee will return to Montreal for his fourth NHL season. Adam Oates is back in Detroit. Darren Poopa, one of three goalies in Buffalo. Craig Niehaus back with the Bruins for his second season. And rookie Mike Dark has traveled to Los Angeles with the St. Louis Blues for tonight's game. But no word yet on whether or not he'll dress for that game. George Servinus will be starting the season with Minnesota's farm team at Indianapolis in the International Hockey League. Ken Hammond of the Kings is with New Haven in the AHL. Tim Friday will be back with the Wings when his injured shoulder heals. The Bruins have sent John Carter to Moncton of the AHL. Jeff Prendergast was reportedly set to sign a free agent contract today with Fredericton. And after being cut by Pittsburgh, Mark Juris has gone on to the camp of the Canadian Olympic team. Now, excluding McPhee, the other 10 were all members of RPI's national championship team in 1985, and as if we didn't know why, we do now. Some great players on that club. At the races today, F and I in the double at Belmont paid $19.80, triple of HFI worth over $5,000, and La Polonaise won the feature for an off-track return of $3.20. Well, this Sunday, we've got a bit of a deviation on our usual football schedule. The NFL today will be on, as usual, at 12.30. But we've got no early game. The actual football won't start till 4 o'clock, when we'll have Buddy Ryan's Eagles against the Giants from the Meadowlands. And now, one last look at last week. The name is quarterback, but backing up is not yet a mastered skill. But you have to give the Packers' Randy Wright some credit here. He goes down, but still, man, put the ball up. And the incompletion, a statement on the Green Bay season to date. Okay, a couple of pass interceptions that take a less than direct route into the opponent's hands. Patriots there off Marino, and the Saints' David Wilson puts it up here. The Redskins play the combination to pull off this interception. And now some of last week's fumbles. The bad exchange in Atlanta, and the Steelers, Mark Malone. Certainly wishes he didn't have to run these wishbone-type options. And they had a second fumble on that one to boot. Giants had a nice one as well. Phil Sims completes the pass to Bobby Johnson, and Johnson's fumble walks the sideline tightrope right into the hands of the Cardinal defender. Now we move on to the punters, Lions punter specifically, Michael Black. He bangs it into the line, suddenly finds himself receiving his own punt. And we'll wrap it up with a new look to High Mom. <laughs> Every week it's something different. Every week. Thank you, Jim. Coming up next on News Center 6, there are a whole lot of employers out there looking for people over 60 to come to work for them. We'll tell you how to hook up. Then we'll speak with one elderly man who has no problem finding work. It's connected to the officials today trying to match jobs with people, specifically older people. The job fair for seniors attracted 32 employers ready to hire. Many employers faced a squeeze, finding what had been the traditional people do fill entry-level jobs, those being young people. Now competition is keen for older people, and Tony Mesa Burger King says it started a wages war. Uh, in different areas, they've had what they call pay wars, and uh, uh, where a Burger King and, say, McDonald's and a Wendy's would uh, 
uh, up their wages to four or five dollars an hour and they, they keep following each other and they end up paying eight dollars an hour but they still don't have enough people working so I don't think that's the answer I think it's it's making a uh, a quality job for a person uh, something they're going to enjoy something they're going to benefit from but a wages war may be starting big Dom sub shops announced today their starting pay rate is going up 65 cents to four dollars an hour well finding a job when you're older can be very difficult and that is part of the plot of a new movie starring Amsterdam native Kirk Douglas. Our Dandy Nicola spoke with Douglas by satellite about his new role and his friends here in the Capital District. You gotta do something really big. Like what? Something they won't laugh at. I'm delighted that we finally got contact and we're talking. How are things in Albany, Dan? This time we're it's unlikely that anyone will laugh at tough guys Bert Lancaster or Kirk Douglas. In Douglas's case, you don't laugh at a 70-year-old who looks better than most men half his age. Well, Dan, I think that you'll find when you watch tough guys that uh, old is no longer, no longer an ugly word. I mean, you can be in your 60s and still move around and run across a speeding train. And the concept that people have about the uh, you know, that's what Bert and I try to show, is that you don't just fall apart. Yo, double crossers! Have you always taken care of your body? Well, yes. You know, if people who knew my father in Amsterdam know that he was the original tough guy. He was the real thing. I create the illusion. Back in Amsterdam, where Kirk still sneaks in now and then, they called him Izzy Dembski. That was before he went away to St. Lawrence, wrestled, joined the service, and then was discovered on Broadway. What about you when you were a kid growing up in Amsterdam? I mean, were you motivated? The motivation was to get out of there, do something. I wanted to get away from my hometown. I wanted to go out into the world, and I think becoming an actor was a form of escape. Let's face it, being an actor is a childlike profession. You have to be naive when Bert and I are arguing in, in tough guys or, or running on top of the train and doing things. We're like grown-up kids. I have you ever reflected, by the way, at what you might have done if you had never left Amsterdam? Well, no, because I knew one way or another, I don't know what would have happened to me, but I knew I, would have, I was going to leave. Uh, I think I'm lucky that my mother and father didn't miss that boat from Russia because uh, our country gave me an opportunity to get a college education and do the kind of things that I want to do. So for that, I'm very grateful. But I always felt one way or another, I was going to go somewhere. I didn't know where. And it's nice to be here in Los Angeles talking to all my friends in the Capital District. For News Center 6, I'm Dan DiNicola. Well, coming up next on News Center 6, meteorologist John Susserich will have a latest on the chilling forecast for East Greenbush, South Glen Falls, Waterford, I guess all of the Northeast. Oh, and then Mr. Food has a new idea to liven up your next dinner. The weather forecast tonight, cold. There are a few other little details about the weather tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Besides cold, there'll be some clouds around, and we'll hopefully have a little bit of light rain. But that's about it. Light Thanks, rain tonight. Thanks, <laughs> that's it, Ernie. Only early, then it'll be gradually clearing skies later on tonight, turning much colder, down to around the freezing mark by tomorrow morning. Tomorrow, even with lots of sunshine, it'll still be very cool. Our high will only be 51 degrees. Clear and very cold tomorrow night, down to 25 degrees. Sunshine on Saturday, high 58 degrees, a little bit warmer. And mostly cloudy skies, chance of a shower on Sunday. Clearing skies on Monday, and that's the weather. But you know, I'm getting a little tired of the same old thing in the weather. As a matter of fact, Ernie was just saying he was getting tired of the same old thing for dinner. Mr. Food tonight. <laughs> you got me in trouble now. That's <laughs> a new idea that's sure to add flavor to your meal. There's a brand new item in the market meat cases. It's lamb. Well, it's brand new because of the new way some of the packers are bringing it to us. They made it as easy as can be. Well, for instance, you know, leg of lamb is delicious, right? But trying to carve it isn't delicious. The bones run every which way, and it's a big job. Well, here's new leg of lamb. It's like that, boneless. All you do is just slice solid meat and enjoy it. Lamb shoulder, that's the same way. But new lamb shoulder, just slice solid meat and enjoy. Now, they must have heard about all of our problems with lamb because they went a few steps further than this. Well, well, just look. They're putting some of them in packages small enough so that you can buy a roast without having to feed an army. So whatever size you need, large, medium, small, 
it's there. Some cuts less money for stews and shish kebab, some cuts a little bit more for your steaks and, and your chops and your roasts. Now, another smart thing is they've got the cooking directions right on each package. Now before, nobody knew how much to buy because of the waste from the bone and the fat. Sure wasn't easy to serve to company. Now, everything's down to easy portions and easy cooking and easy cutting and serving. Now, it costs a little more, but it's so today sensible because there's no waste and no time lost that it's really more affordable now than it was before and more enjoyable and more today light. I don't even know if it's in all of the stores. It's in some. And if it isn't, it will be in time because this isn't only today, it's the future. There's no more of, of more fat and bone than meat. Uh -uh. For us, the new lamb is going to be pure. Oh, it's so good. Coming up next on News Center 6, time for this week's viewer mail. And Jack's dome gets crowned by one writer. The story of the three Teamsters convicted of racketeering, Ernie's report on the Amish people living in Montgomery County, and the return of a seeing eye dog are some of the stories that comprise this week's mailbag. Well, a North Creek viewer takes us to task incorrectly, we feel, for not covering the trial of three Teamsters members for their part in a racketeering scam involving the making of the movie Ghost Story. The writer says we ignored coverage of the event. He says the station should realize it concerns about 7,000 working members of the Teamsters in Albany, Schenectady, and Amsterdam, and almost as many on pension and their families. Well, all we can say is that the viewer has not been watching faithfully. During the course of the trial and its conclusion, which ended in the Teamsters' conviction, we aired several stories about them. Ernie's Amish stories continue to raise eyebrows and garner praise. A writer from Afreda who lives near the Amish community thanks Ernie for helping him better understand those people. We have had our, only our preconceived notions to utilize in our encounters with them. With knowledge comes understanding. But another viewer accuses Ernie of being like Satan, who tempted Eve when he interviewed an Amish teenager. The Amish do not believe in granting interviews. The writer says maybe he, Ernie, should have shoved that mic, or rather, maybe he, the teenager, should have shoved that microphone down your throat since you don't understand common courtesy and the rights of others. Mm -hmm. The family of the blind Albany man whose seeing eye dog disappeared thanked us for helping find Thurman. They say, we appreciate all you have done and love and concern that was shown to us by everyone, and those are the letters this week. Well, there is one more letter, Ernie. It's from Esperance in Schoharie County, and it concerns the presentation of part of Jack Arnicke's money report. The writer says, quote, the only criticism I have is the dome of the ticker tape machine being shown next to Jack's head. This is what it looks like Monday through Friday. Well, Jack read the letter, and being the sport that he is, agreed with the writer's comments. And he contacted Sidney Slavin in our graphics department. She was able to make a few minor adjustments to the ticker tape machine. And we hope <laughs> this meets with the letter writer's satisfaction. If you don't see what we've done, <laughs> we've, um, we've given the dome a toop, I think is the best yes, way to put it. The stock market dome now has... <laughs> well, that's, those are the letters. At 11 tonight, the Hassan Fuss incident has opened up a whole Pandora's box of questions about what's going on in Nicaragua. Today we'll get some, or tonight rather, we'll get some insights firsthand from a woman who lived in Nicaragua and has one side of the story. And of course, we'll be on top of any other news that might break in our area throughout the evening. That's our news. Stay tuned now for more news on CBS. Right here on WRGB. CBS Evening News. Be sure to watch as the stars come out for Entertainment Tonight, only on TV6 at 7.30.